Coming up today on Airborne, the U.S. Navy's unmanned X-47B completes a watershed event in naval aviation. The CAF launches a new airbase initiative and a space oddity, the first music video ever made in space. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. The X-47B Unmanned Combat Air System Demonstrator completed its first ever carrier-based catapult launch from USS George H.W. Bush off the coast of Virginia on Tuesday. The unmanned aircraft launched from the deck of George H.W. Bush and executed several planned low approaches to the carrier and it safely transited across the Chesapeake Bay to land at Naval Air Station Patuxent River, Maryland after a 65-minute flight. Vice Administrator David Buss, commander of the Naval Air Forces, the Navy's air boss, said, quote, Today we saw a small but significant pixel in the future picture of our Navy as we began integration of unmanned systems into arguably the most complex warfighting environment that exists today, the flight deck of a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, end quote. Buzz called the launch a watershed event in naval aviation. Over the next few weeks, the X-47B aircraft will fly approaches to the ship multiple times and eventually land on the pitching flight deck. The commemorative Air Force CAF has announced plans to establish the CAF National Air Base at a major metropolitan area and its intent to launch a nationwide search immediately. The CAF plans to establish several air bases at key locations around the country. At each air base, the public attraction will contain flying vintage military aircraft combined with interactive educational displays, entertaining activities, and an annual air show. Additionally, the CAF will look to partner with other leading innovative, historical, educational, and entertainment-based organizations to accomplish its mission. CAF President and CEO Stephen C. Brown explained the new initiative, saying, quote, In today's environment, we have to find new ways to educate and break away from traditional and increasingly outdated methods, end quote. This announcement does not mean that the CAF is moving out of Midland, Texas, or has been headquartered since 1991. Founded more than 55 years ago, the CAF is dedicated to maintaining and flying its fleet of 156 military aircraft in order to educate Americans on the history and importance of our country's efforts to protect freedom through air power. NASA has been responsible for many historical firsts. But who would have thought? The first music video ever made in space. ISS Commander Chris Hadfield, the first Canadian to command the station, has performed a stunning rendition of David Bowie's Space Oddity while aboard the orbiting outpost. Released Monday, May 13th, the video quickly went viral with several million hits in its first day and now is well past the 12 million mark last time we checked. Available on YouTube, Hatfield proves himself to be a pretty accomplished guitarist and singer while handling a guitar in a way that could only be accomplished in microgravity. Andrew Tidby, who helped produce the video, said the project was Hatfield's idea and they're hoping to get 1 billion views. It seems the 2013 graduating class of the U.S. Air Force Academy will have a proper send-off after all. Even if the federal sequester says the Thunderbirds can't perform the traditional graduation flyover. The National Museum of World War II Aviation in Colorado Springs and the Texas Flying Legends Museum of Houston, Texas say they plan to honor the 2013 class with a flyover of vintage aircraft, including two B-25 J. Mitchell bombers two P-51D Mustang fighters, a P-47D Thunderbolt fighter, a FG-1D Corsair fighter, a P-40K Warhawk fighter, a FM-2 Wildcat fighter, and a TBM-3E Avenger bomber. The Colorado Springs Gazette reports that the entire group of airplanes will be on display at the National Museum of World War II Aviation 
May the 27th through the 29th, with the graduation flyovers being held on the 29th. On the very day, his first ever Made in Space music video was being released on the World Wide Web. Space Station Commander Chris Hadfield of the Canadian Space Agency, Soyuz Commander Roman Romanenko of the Russian Federal Space Agency, and NASA Flight Engineer Tom Marshburn returned safely to Earth. The trio landed their Soyuz spacecraft Monday southeast of Kazakhstan at about 2231 Eastern Time. Hadfield, Romanenko, and Marshburn traveled almost 62 million miles while completing 2,336 orbits of Earth. The trio spent 146 days in space, 144 of which were aboard the station. Pavel Vinogradov of Roscosmos is now commander of Expedition 36. If you're one of those who likes to do things a bit differently, then you'll want to make plans to attend the 10th Annual Alternative Engine Roundup, sponsored by our good friends at Contact Magazine. The event is set for June 8th at Yuba County Airport in Marysville, California. The event is being held in conjunction with the West Regional Fly-In and Air Show June the 7th through the 9th. Organizers say that if your airplane has an alternative engine, you'll be given free admission to the event whether you fly in or bring your aircraft on a trailer. The offer is also extended to alternative engines mounted on a test or display stand, running or not. There will also be a full day of educational forums focusing on alternative engines. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds and learning proper crosswind landing techniques. Even today, most crosswind landing skills are learned through trial and error, sometimes with disastrous results. Believe it or not, the most common contributing factor in weather-related accidents each year is crosswinds. The second most common factor is wind gusts. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. It teaches pilots the proper techniques to meet and beat these top two causes of weather-related landing accidents. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in challenging crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird flight simulations, the Redbird X-Wind SE, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne, Aero TV, our website, or podcast, drop us an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. Boeing has named the executives that will lead the 777X program in a sign that industry watchers say means an announcement about the latest version of the widebody jetliner will be coming soon. The executive team was named in an internal message sent to employees on Friday. 777X Vice President Bob Feldman said that the move indicates that the company is getting ready to shift from developing a concept to detailed design work for a real airplane. This according to a report appearing in the Seattle Times. Industry observers suggest that Boeing may be moving forward because of pressure exerted by Airbus with their development of the A350XWB that promises a 25% advantage in fuel efficiency over the current models of the 777. Cyndia Aerospace announced today that Midland Instruments, a full-service avionics system repair and maintenance company, has received Transport Canada STC approval for installation of Cyndia's ST3400 TAS RMI installation on SA-226T and SA-226TC Metro models. For Remeter Aviation, a regional airline operating out of Winnipeg International Airport is the end user of this STC, which grants installation approval for the SAC S-35 to be installed in Perimeter's 11 Metro 2 aircraft to comply with the new Transport Canada regulation regarding TAS Class A which is effective on July 4, 2014. Sandia's SAC-735 is four instruments in one. It's an altitude encoder, provides altitude altering, provides fuel flow data reporting, 
and is a full up air data computer. Today, instead of looking into the future, Jim takes a chance to reflect on the past and remembers some absent friends, especially an old ultralight buddy by the name of Frank Beagle, who passed away this past week. Here's this week's barnstorming. Let me depart from the usual. We're not going to politicize today. We're not even going to talk about you know, the latest and greatest and the things that are bugging us or encouraging us. What we are going to do is remember an absent friend. We lost Frank Beagle this week. To those of you who uh, spent time in the ultralight and light plane area at Oshkosh, his was a familiar name because his was a familiar voice. He was the guy doing much of the announcing and much of the narrating and encouraging people to see and do all the amazing things that aviation and sport aviation in particular would allow them to to break free of Earth, to find the freedoms and the enjoyment that they were watching for themselves. He encouraged many a person to come into uh, our fold, and in fact, I know for a fact that hundreds did. He was a safety advocate. He participated in all kinds of regional activities as well as on the national level at Oshkosh. But the thing I'll remember him most for was a crazy day in 1981, where after flying all the way from Watsonville, California, and a pterodactyl, with my uh, air show buddy, Patty Trusty. We met up with Frank and a number of other ultralighters down at Fond du Lac to wait for the air show to die down so that we could fly into the ultralight area once the airspace was clear. And late that afternoon, we all took off. Myself and Danny and Frank and Patty and a number of other folks. Blasted off, reached the dizzying height of 500, maybe 600 feet above, uh, I think it's Route 41, worked our way up north to uh, Oshkosh. Two or three minutes out, Frank just got a case of the aerial giggles, you could almost hear them over the din of the motor, and just started pitching up and down. And before you know it, this flight of, I guess there were four, five, six of us at various times, was just pitching up and down and just having a great old time. It was this big snaking up and down undulation through the sky, 500, 600, 700 feet in the air, all the way to Oshkosh, everybody with these big grins, craziness, eyes bright, having the time of our lives, just looking forward to getting in on the first day of Oshkosh 1981, where, as he promised, Paul Pobresny was waiting to meet myself and Patty and welcome us from, well, over 1,500 miles of slogging along at 35 to 55 miles an hour in, in our little pterodactyl fledglings. It was one of the greatest days of my life, and Frank shared it. I can't believe he's gone. He's gone too soon even at age 70. But he was one of the best of us. He certainly was one of the kookiest of us. And he certainly was one of the best friends anybody could ever ask for in aviation. And we really miss him. Thank you, Frank. God bless. For the Aero News Network, Aero TV, and Airborne, I'm Jim Campbell. There's no denying it, eBay is a unique concept. People all over the world auction off everything, including the kitchen sink. And this past week, an air traffic control tower. That's right, this past week, bidders had the chance to win and purchase a used air traffic control tower. In the product description, the owner said that the tower, which is made largely of aluminum, was originally installed at an airport. He bought it and then turned it into a man cave, installing a custom sofa and even an emergency escape door. The structure is just over 32 feet tall, weighs just under 10,000 pounds, bolts to a concrete pad, and the seller says it has withstood 80 miles per hour winds at his location. Well, that's our program. Remember, you can get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. And please remember that Airborne is streamed twice weekly and is always online. Join us again next Tuesday for another edition of Airborne. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.